Hello, I'm Lauren and this is Improving the World. I'm an international improviser based in Hong Kong and I talk to amazing improv women all over the world. Today I'm joined by Shannon Dale Stott. She is based out of Austin, Texas and we talked about all things to do with boxes. So being in boxes, what it feel like to be put in a box, busting out of your box, unpacking boxes. It was really great. I hope that you enjoy. Today we're talking about the boxes of improv. We're going to get super meta and deep with this one. We're talking about the fact you thought of this, that we are in a box as it were when we're in a theater or on a stage. Yeah. There are the boxes that our mind creates. There are the societal boxes. So we're going to dive into and unpack some of those boxes and see where we get to today. Shannon, yeah. you are an improviser of 20 plus years. So mm -hmm. you are young at heart and old in improv. You are an improv video creator, and you more specifically have, especially with the YouTube channel that you run, the goal of trying to get voices heard in a real or virtual place by women who are of color and also just women or female identifying folks. Right. So what does your average day look like, either in an e-space or when we are dealing in a physical space? Uh, usually I'm teaching. So however that teaching comes across. So the, uh, in the evening I'm teaching, in the daytime I'm preparing. Teaching is my passion. I love, I love, I love teaching improv. I love it. Like I really love it. Like yeah. I really love it. Yeah. Do you, but do you love it? I want to know. Yeah. I, uh, let me see if I can. Yeah. I really Okay, okay. Love it. <laughs> much closer to the camera. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For you, what was it like in terms of, it could be what inspired you to go or the first class or the, the beginning days, but what was that experience like for you starting? We need one of those like Bill and Ted, like, I can make that happen. Yeah. This is how I started. My parents would not let me be an actor, basically. They were like, absolutely not. You can't be a theater major. Mm -hmm. You have to do something else that's going to earn you money. So I chose to be an English major. Okay. Uh, <laughs> You're like, small but side the, step, but close. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it, is it, did it, did it work? <laughs> I don't think it worked. <laughs> because of my passion for the theater, I stuck around and was in the theater department all the time. Mm -hmm. I found comedy sports. I auditioned. I got in. And I'll tell you what. So I auditioned. I got in. And the day that I auditioned, this young girl came up to me. She, I guess she was my age, but she was mm -hmm. like, hey, I saw you audition, and uh, do you want to teach improv? And I was like, I mean, I've never done improv in my life, so no. She's like, it's going to be fine. You'll be fine. How about you teach? She was part of this other organization that was teaching improv to young adults, like teenagers, okay. at, after school. And so... <laughs> I took the job. I, I was like, sure, I'll take that job. And so what I did was I, on two, on Wednesdays, I would go to rehearsal. And then on Thursdays, I would go to class and I would just regurgitate <laughs> whatever it was. Yeah. yeah, I was with comedy sports for as long as I was in Richmond. So 15, oh, 15 years. And in that time, you know, I obviously I performed, but I was doing all short form. So mm -hmm. for those people who are watching this and they're like, short form, what's short form? Mm -hmm. uh, whose line is it anyway type things, short yeah. games, fun games. And so I didn't know too much about any other type of improv. Then I came to Austin where I am now. Mm -hmm. I saw the Hideout Theater do a completely improvised play from beginning to end. And that was amazing. And so that was my, I fell in love with that and I started doing narrative. Uh, and then I started teaching. I was, you know, obviously I was teaching long before that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I loved, loved it, loved it, loved it, loved the yeah. journey. Brilliant. Your journey is a little bit different from mine. Um, mm. When I say a little, I mean tremendously. So, I don't think I've ever met anyone who says that they started teaching like day one. Like That's totally the been day. Crazy. <laughs> That's so crazy. Um, when I started, it was something that my mother wanted to do. She saw an ad in the paper for a free improv workshop series and she wanted to go. But now, was she managing a teenager? Potentially. Or was she getting a pal to go? Potentially. And we went to these workshops. They were taught by the, if you're out there in the ether listening, the phenomenal Clifford and Dixie in Santa Cruz, California. I love you and I give you my everything. 
And they were this amazing duo who took turns teaching. They also performed together and they taught us for free for six weeks. And at the end of the six weeks, we did an improvathon for 12 hours for the local theater mm -hmm. money. So the new groups who had formed off the back of the classes would get the earlier slots in the day. And the people who were the more experienced or the groups that would come down from like the big smoke, you know, nearby and stuff would, would get to perform the late night spots. So we would perform early and then I would just sit and watch like 11 more hours of improv and take necessary pee breaks and consume as appropriate, but primarily just sit and just <laughs> absorb. So I did that every single summer for six years and I just studented as heavily as I could. I was uh, the only young one. Everyone else was an adult mm. and it was mind boggling to me that I was able to be capable enough in a space with real adults right. and to play with them. And so that inspired me. And they were like, let's all do Italian accents. And I was like, I've never been to Italy. I can do it though, sure. We had very, very diverse ways of starting our improv, but for you then, as you kept doing it, who were the people mm -hmm. who pulled you in? Who were those who inspired you or intrigued you or pulled you into the world? Because we can have in improv certain voices that are louder than others or more present than others. Who were the people who you were like, oh, I wanna be like you, I wanna learn from you and so on? Really, Christine Walters, who was running Comedy Sports Richmond, along mm. with Dave Gao, who was the artistic director there, mm. really had a had a vision of what improv looked like and felt like specifically. So it was less of like you know, if I'm looking for people who were like way out there, like Tracy Ullman was probably the first person that I saw on TV that I was like, what is that? Mm. What kind of comedy is that? Mm. Uh, but Dave Gow and Christine Walters really formulated a, a family, right? Mm. And this idea of lifting people up, working together. What does a show look like? What mm. does it look like for people to package a, a product an improv product mm. and it's interesting because comedy sports if you uh, if you've seen it or haven't seen it mm. it is it is very packaged it's mm. improv played as a sport right so there's two yeah. teams there's a blue team and a red team there's a ref people wear jerseys there's mm. points all, all of that so yeah. it's very like it's very polished as far as the product that you're getting and it's super fun i love it you were talking about uh you were the youngest one mm. and it was completely different for me like everyone was young people were out of high school into college right out of college uh and they had this idea that people should take care of each other right the mm. like older improvisers should take care of the younger improvisers mm -hmm. and so on and mm. once you were seasoned enough then you started to teach as well so you started mm. to teach if you were interested in something you did workshops you could do character workshops or you could do uh voice workshops how to how to ref all those things mm. and so it really felt like a community you know and we learned we really understood that community so there was just a lot of people saying things like, we, are you listening? You know, things like that, where mm. just not only on stage, but off stage, right? And when you heard it in rehearsals, you're like, oh, right, 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 I'm, I'm listening. But sometimes people would say it either jokingly or for real off stage. And you're learning, oh, the things I'm doing on stage are apropos, <laughs> like are mm. necessary for me to be doing in real life. And improv is, an interesting medium because it asks you to use almost everything you know artistically mm -hmm. and show it in the moment. But those two people influenced how I saw improv and how I went through life learning it and teaching it. Yeah. So let's drop into this one now. Why improv? I mean, I always sort of say that I feel like we're trying to sell people into a cult because the way that improvisers talk about improv, like we have blinders on and we just think it's the bee's knees and we just adore it and we will sell our souls and give a left arm to keep improvising. So right. I mean, what is that? Why improv? Why do we love it so much? Why do you love it so much? Why should everyone do it? Not 
people, not some people, everyone. You know, why is it applicable to corporate as well as confidence building, as well as, you know, public speaking? Why is it important for artistic and non-artistic people to do? Why improv, I say to why you? Why improv? How about this? What's interesting to me about the way I teach improv hmm. is my focus isn't about you on stage. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a second, that's a secondary focus. My focus is about you moving through the world. Mm. If you can move through the world the way you can best move through the world, you specifically, if I can teach Lauren to be, to present herself the best way she can, mm. then I can take that best way and put it on the stage in front of people. And then when you, when you have this running idea of, okay, I need, someone is speaking, I need to listen. Oh, uh, when I do listen, I listen like this. Like I, I listen intently with my face and my body. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it, that person is speaking, but they're not, they are actually done with the thing that they are saying. It is my turn. It, it is my turn to speak now. Uh, I need to be fearless. I need to um, take my chance. I need to bring other people on. It is now time for me to bring people up uh, all of those things are moving through the world, right? They're not necessarily being funny. They're not necessarily um, being able to speak in a funny, a fun voice. They're not, they're not those things. They're not uh, being able to mime things correctly. <laughs> like improv, because it is a vehicle to teach you how to be the best version of yourself. Oh, yeah. snap. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. I'm this idea of women, black women, people of color, people who are not white men, right? Mm -hmm. They don't enjoy improv because I think, right? <laughs> it magnifies what they are already struggling with mm. in real life, mm. right? When, when you get on stage, if you are just there for the giggles and the laughs, mm -hmm and that's what you're learning, mm -hmm. people will step on you. You will, people will step on you. People will put you in very awkward situations. Mm -hmm. People will uh, talk over you. People won't listen to you, all of those things. And it's bad enough that that happens to us, you know, in general, out there in the workplace or mm -hmm. just out there, goddamn, in the grocery store, excuse mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it's bad enough that it happens in, like, our lives. Yeah. Um, and it's so it's a horrifying almost it's scary to come to a space where one you're trying to be artistic you're trying to be creative mm -hmm. and those things are following you uh onto the stage into your creative life mm -hmm. and and such and so going back to why i teach improv it's because i feel like i can teach the world to listen, to be better, to be more inclusive. I can teach those skills through the vehicle of improv. And so when someone takes the chance, if I've done my job, when someone takes the chance of showing up to a level 101 improv class, we are inclusive. We are pulling that person up. We are making sure that they feel comfortable, all of those things. And it's just like, it has nothing to do with improv or being on stage it just has to do with being a good decent human being uh-huh 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 is that too big did i put too much on improv more? <laughs> no i think checkbox nailed it there is something interesting about improv and uh, especially within the space of the arts it feels different than some other things i think that we could have yoga and painting equate to life and and we could you know uh to pun off of that, paint all of these different other opportunities to take an right. art form or, or something, uh, meditation and make it like life. But for me with improv, yeah, you mm -hmm. want to say something? Mm -hmm. You want to say something? No, maybe okay. you're going to say it. Come, keep talking, keep talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me with improv, one of the things is that there is this uh, big fear that people have about having people watch them, have eyeballs on them. Mm -hmm. And when you sign up for improv, you're signing up to be looked at. So mm -hmm. essentially, whatever your judgment is, they're thinking that and they're judging me or these these judgments that you say when you when you navigate through life that are being put upon you, the boxes that you're being put into. Hello. Right. Now the virtual background makes sense. 
um, the, <laughs> the day that you go to improv for the first time, and maybe for mm -hmm. some people the hundredth time, is the day that you're saying, I'm willing to be looked at, I'm going to get up, whether it's on a physical stage or it's in an e-stage format, or you're going to be somewhere where you're allowing eyeballs to be on you and mm -hmm. have to be willing to let some sort of a guard down to an extent you're already accepting yeah. and taking ownership of you, what you're going to project. And this whole idea of people getting up and being looked at leads mm -hmm. to this idea of I must be funny and I'm going to say dildo and get a laugh because now you're looking at that and you're laughing at right. that. You're not laughing right. at me. You're laughing at that thing I said. So you're laughing at right. the funny thing or the moment I created or the great mime I did or whatever it is. You're not laughing at me. So something for me about the improv is when we take that layering and you peel back beyond it and you're just starting with me to your point about I'm coming and you're working on me as a human. That's the core of it for me and why improv is from my perspective, so magical because I'm choosing to be open and like just, just a little bit for a minute and get up on stage and just be me for a sec. And even though I right. made that joke, it was still me who made it. So yeah. I think that's a really scary thing for, for folks. Yeah. Yes. So yes, yes. So this, the, that feeling of people are going to look at me. Mm. All right, I've got two ideas. This, mm. this feeling of people are going to look at me. Mm. Yes, yes is the answer. Yeah. And I need people to realize that that's okay. Mm. I love improv because of the vulnerability that that takes. You were talking about vulnerability, right? Just like mm. the vulnerability that it takes to showcase who you are in mm. front of people. And I, I love that. I love teaching people to own exactly who it is that they, they are. Yeah. Okay. So that Love owning that. who you are, right? So owning who you are. And then you're talking about how the, the idea that you can take painting or yoga or mm -hmm. art or things like that and also equate it to life. Mm -hmm. the, the piece that I love about improv is that you must do improv with other people. Mm -hmm. And that for me is the nugget, like I, other artistic forms, you can equate them to life. And I'm sure, you know, of course you can do, what is with the, that yoga <laughs> where people are like standing on each other? You know what I'm talking about. Oh, uh, standing on each other yoga. Yeah, you know yeah, what it yeah. is. <laughs> but you can do, you can do that kind of thing. I, you know, you can, sure, you can paint with other people. You can be collaborative. But one of the things that like excites me about improv is the vulnerability the, the I am looking at you and then the sharing, like being vulnerable, learning to be vulnerable and learning to share that vulnerability with someone else is a, is a big deal. Like we are creating something, we are creating a scene, we are creating a world, we are learning to live in that world. We're learning to speak a language in that world and we're doing it while people are looking at us and we're doing it together, right? Mm -hmm. I, and that, I. I, I love that because it teaches us to move through the world. This is mm -hmm. how we move through the world with, with eyes on us, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Now let's come back to something that you referenced and we're talking mm -hmm. about this um, fact that you're already navigating through the world, which is hard as a human being for many, even more so than others. Now you're doing it potentially, we speak to you, uh, people who are female identifying and then people who are of color. And then if you are the beautiful double down of the both of them, woohoo. So you're already navigating the world as such. Now you're opting to get up on stage potentially or in an E space. And we can talk about what it looks like to do improv here or to like yank yourself into the, the whole of the internet right now. Shannon, what are your thoughts on doing improv in an e-space and furthermore for and with people who are female identifying of color? That was a very big, not quite question. We're doing quite. a thought experiment here. Uh -huh. So let's break this down into a couple of things. Mm. One, just navigating improv as a person of color in mm. general is a mm. scary thing. Navigating improv as a female, female ad identifying person is hard, you know, 
I mean, we all, we all have at least heard of horror stories in improv, right? Things mm -hmm. like, you know, people immediately assuming that you're a hooker, people immediately assuming that you're a, um, you're a secretary, people mm -hmm. uh, assuming you're a sister, mother, you know, you can't possibly be anything but a baby having a uh, person, right? Mm -hmm. So you, the characters, that is difficult. And then the horror stories of, uh, you know, and now I'm like telling these horror stories and I'm thinking to myself, wait, Shannon, you're trying to get people to do improv. Don't scare them away. Like, sh shush your face. Shush. Like, <laughs> like, no, you should come. You should do it. Come on. Yeah. Horror stories of people, uh, you know, characterizing you as the janitor, characterizing you as a basketball player, whatever happens to, you know, people of color, uh, people of color. So then do you yeah. get pigeonholed into the baby having janitor? Are you like a super pregnant janitor or like, wish, like a pregnant a basketball player? Pregnant. You're like, yeah. nobody is that creative. No, there's a, there's a basketball in here and a basketball here. No, like I really, I really wish, but no, no. I've been super lucky. The people that were around me in at, like comedy sports Richmond were lovely just mm -hmm. lo loved me and I never found myself in situ that I can remember in situations that made me feel terrible mm -hmm. but as a teacher I have students who come to me with these with with these things and how do we navigate them mm -hmm. if you can find a teacher it's me I'm the one uh -huh. If you can find a teacher who is teaching people how to be decent human beings, right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. one. And two, shutting that shit down when it comes, right? Mm -hmm. Then you will have a better experience. Mm -hmm. Also, on the flip side of that, improv teaches you how to handle it. It mm -hmm. teaches you how to stand up for yourself. I, oh, man, I can never stress enough for mm -hmm. people is that improv is the, I think, one and only space uh, that you can transform yourself into anything you want, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can be a thought, you can be a bat, you can be the ground, you can be rain, you know, mm -hmm. you can be another culture, whatever it is you want to try to become, mm -hmm. you can become that. And because of that, if you take advantage of it, in the moments where you are something is going wrong on stage, if you can take advantage of becoming gone, a specter or whatever, mm -hmm. you get to practice in this, like on stage, what it feels like or how to deal with things in real life. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So Quite. I definitely have had um, instances where I've had to, you know, oh, <laughs> poof, I'm flying away. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. I'm a vampire and I'm yeah. out and I can do that. But in my mind, I have the time to think, oh, this is how I would really react to that. Or I've been, I've also been able to step out of scenes and say things like, say things to the audience, mm. you know, like this person woke up from the dream that they were having and realized that they were actually a nice person mm. and chose their words very carefully the next time they spoke. <laughs> then this is, it's an awareness of like, oh, I get to tell you that you need to be aware and I get to tell me that uh, I don't accept that thing that you're saying. Right. Mm -hmm. I think one of the critical things that you said, which should be pointed out, is this ability to say no or to yes. shift or yes. to change the narrative in this space yes. that we're talking about because you can truly opt to own the moment and augment the moment. And this is something which potentially people may not literally be able to do or be empowered to do or feel that they're empowered to do in a space that is outside of improv. But when you are in that improv box, you are not in a box because you are right. the box to your point. You're making the box, you're creating it, you're creating your rules of your 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 life, your existence as it were. And so yeah. this ability to either go meta and say, hey audience, uh, did you see that too? Cause I caught that moment. Or yeah. um, I kicked people off of stage. I've come on and just ended a scene and been like, sorry audience, let's try that again. Let's try again. Yeah. Um, 
or as the character to poof as a bat, which is a way to negate an improv, but it is also a way to say I'm not accepting this. But part of what's interesting here for me is that you need to really be self-aware, aware of what's going on, and then aware of your boundaries and when you're willing to step up and say something. And that's the training. That's yes. why we have to rehearse improv. That's why when yes. people say, wait, you're rehearsing improv, what's that? Don't you just do it? It's improv. You do. You have to train. And that's the, that's the whole point to move through this sort of topic, right? Mm -hmm. That is when I am trying to recruit Black women, women of color, women of any ethnicity, female identifying women, women. Mm -hmm. Did I say women enough? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of, of, any, of any ethnicity, I recruit them because improv teaches you to be able to do exactly what you're saying, um, to realize your own boundaries. That I love that. I love that one. Like, how do how do I become aware of what is happening around me, and how do I become aware of what's happening inside of me, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we are feeling those things, whatever those things are in the real world, mm -hmm. they usually are so surprising, right? Mm -hmm. It's like ah, you. Ugh. And then you walk away from those confrontations or you walk away from those situations feeling like, oh, I should have said, or I would have said, or I could have said, right? Yeah. But when you've taken an improv class and you've been taking them for a while, mm -hmm. you become truly aware of like, oh, this is the situation I'm in and I am empowered to say something about that situation or change yeah. the situation. Yeah. Have an agile reaction. Yeah. Right. Um. Let's talk about the world that we're living in right now. So we've alluded to it, but we're talking to people through their computers or chosen devices, this device right. not sponsored. So we're talking to people through our own little boxes here. Yes. And um, what are you doing through the interweb and what are you doing with improv through the interweb? So uh, I feel like this is gonna sound super controversial or super weird, but I, understand that when this pandemic happened we mm. all Im improvisers art artistic people needed to figure out a way to use this medium mm. in order to continue our livelihoods <laughs> right period the end and power to the every single person who is out there continuing to do their thing in yeah. this medium word now we can do better. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm doing improv videos, or rather, uh, videos that teach us how to use our medium to the best of our ability. Mm. Um, you know, the thing is that a lot of theaters are really in turmoil and struggling right now, and what they are doing is putting out content, and that content is reaching the people that normally might come to that theater or mm. friends of the people who own the theater or who are in the theater, right? Yeah. But we we don't know how long this is gonna last and it so sucks to say that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we don't know. What if this is until 2021? Yeah. What, what if, okay? Yeah. So yeah. if that is the case, how do we, one, take care of the people who are still in our shows, right? There are a lot of improvisers out there who are looking to theater directors and people who are teaching improv to show them how to use the medium. How are we taking care of them? Are we still doing the green room chat? Are we still hanging out before shows, you know, in quotes? Are we still saying the words, I've got your back before a show? And how are we taking care of our actors? Yeah. then how are we taking care of our audiences, right? Like, mm -hmm. am I showing up? Really, am I showing up in my pajamas? Like, am I? <laughs> am I showing up? Like, I, we were always told, dress slightly on stage, slightly better than your audience, right? Because mm -hmm. you're doing a show, you're performing. We're mm -hmm. still doing a show here. This is still mm -hmm. performance. And mm -hmm. I understand that, you know, some of this is, reaching out, making sure that people feel good or they have a place to uh, laugh or rather they have a place to connect with us. Like mm -hmm. they feel like when they're watching, you're sad too. As a performer, you're sad too. Also, we're this, all of this is a 
as on purpose as I can make it, right? So <laughs> that I can, right? So that I can take care of my audience. My audience mm. came to see me do some some show, some improvised mm. show. And mm. so how do we take care of them? Mm. I, right now, I'm sort of taking a back seat and seeing what people are doing, how to help them succeed, mm. how to help students. I got a comment recently that was something to the effect of, the last time I came to your class, which was an online class, mm. and I didn't, there was no laughing. We didn't laugh. Oh. And yeah, we didn't laugh. And I, I missed that. Like I, I, I'm there to be silly. I'm there mm -hmm. to have fun. These times are hard. Yeah. And it was an interest for me. I was like, I thought that is so true. Mm. But that is not what Shannon Dale Stott is here to teach in mm -hmm. this class. Mm -hmm. If yeah. we have a two hour class, what I am here to do is prepare you just mm. like I was there to prepare you before is yeah. to prepare you for this medium. Mm. How can you be your best self? And this goes, now we're going all the way back, right? To why I love improv, right? How do I prepare you? How do I bring you, Lauren, your mm. best self mm. into improv, into this medium? Mm. How do I do that? How do I teach you to be a great improviser using this? Because you can no longer, you know, touch people or, I don't know, bring things out and sprinkle the audience with confetti. <laughs> but uh, you asked me what I'm, what I'm doing during this time. The top things are, one, still recruiting, still telling mm -hmm. people, women of color, uh, that it's okay and that it is acceptable and that we want them in this medium that is improv. Yeah. That's yeah. one. Two, I'm really looking at what people are doing in this time, theaters and shows, and trying to just see, is there something better that can be done? And if so, make a video about it so that people have a resource to do better, mm -hmm. right? Those are, those are the big ones for me right now. I love improv so much. I love it so much. And I want you to succeed in the medium. That's all I want. I yeah. want you to succeed on stage. And if the stage is your living room and Zoom or whatever, I want you to succeed here. Yeah. Yeah. So Shannon, do you love improv? I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Taking us to a gorgeous place. If your improv peers are watching this, if the younger version of you is watching this, or if someone who's never tried improv is watching this, and today, bonus, if a woman of color is watching this, yes, please, what do you want that individual to know? What are your words of wisdom? If you are watching this, are you vulnerable enough? Are you wanting to become vulnerable enough? Mm. Are you wanting to become the best version of yourself and you have not yet found a fun way to explore that? Mm. Take an improv class. Mm. Nice one. And if they yeah. want to take improv classes, they can take them from you online or when we are in a real world lifestyle again. So yeah. Uh, I'll put links below, but just tell everyone if they want to get a hold of you, if they want to um, throw money at you, if they want to take your workshops or watch you, how can they do that? How can they find you? Go on YouTube. You mm -hmm. can look up SD Stott, S D S T O T T, and you'll find me. Mm -hmm. um, you'll find all of my videos and all of that. Yeah. Uh, if you would like to help move me forward, go mm -hmm. onto my Patreon page become a member there that keeps me teaching classes. And then I teach classes at the Hideout Theater here in Austin. We yeah. are doing online classes so that we can all be prepared for this improv like this. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. And I've never been to Austin, but is it true that the saying is keep Austin weird and just how weird is it? right on the money we were cool. the first people like to say like oh keep this weird keep that weird but uh -huh. we were the first ones uh -huh. there right when i moved to austin i saw a half naked man on a unicycle but not just any like unicycle like one of those three stack unicycles mm -hmm. like riding down one of the main thoroughways <laughs> yeah. of yeah. austin i was like yeah. this is that's weird that's good yeah. i'm like yes and <laughs> right <laughs> like sure 
Thank you so very much for your time and your energy. Shannon Dale Scott, you were an utter joy to speak with and I loved the things that you said. If people want to find you, they can come to Austin when travel is allowed and humans are allowed to see each other in the flesh again. But until then, you can look on her YouTube channel. Information will be below. And if you are looking for more voices from women in improv, this is Improving the World. I am Lauren and there's more where that came from. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Lauren. Bye, all. Thank you. So, did you love the video? If you did, please say kind, wonderful things in the comments down below and look for more Improving the World, where I talk to amazing women in improv from all over. See you later, y'all. <laughs>